You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 241, Psalm 24 and 29 in the ancient context. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you doing this week? Well, well, it's it's been a difficult week. Uh, some listeners may know my dad is not in, in good health. I mean, I mentioned that in the newsletter from time to time. So he's had a rough week. So pray for him and, and my mom especially. You know, if if this is, you know, my dad's time to go and it's it is serious, then uh, I'm more concerned for her. You know, he's a believer and and he's ready, but uh, it would be rough for her, obviously, to be married. I don't know, 50 some years. So, you know, it's it's been a rough week and we'll just you know, we'll see. We'll see. That's all you can do is wait. Absolutely. We all are in our prayers. And also uh, for those that are in Denver. We may or may not be able to uh, have that on Friday night, so stay tuned. We'll yeah. If I end up having to bail, you know, and go home, that'll be the reason. So, so yeah. just be on the lookout for that, and uh, keep Mike's family in your prayers. Uh, Mike, uh, we have a topic this week. Uh, I'm pretty excited uh, about. I'm sure you are getting back into the Old Testament. So, you mentioned that you wanted to do something for yourself. So, I, I assume this, is, <laughs> this subject is close to something you're interested in. Yeah, it, it is. You know, I, I get questions about, you know, the value of interpreting things in their ancient context. I got one this week. Um, actually, it was on an interview where one of the, the questioners sort of criticized me for inserting ancient stuff into the Bible, like Ugaritic stuff. And of course, they didn't understand that the point was, no, I, I can't really talk about parallels between the Hebrew Bible and ancient Near Eastern material unless there's actually stuff in the Bible already that is analogous. So I don't think they quite got the point. And that, you know, set my wheels and in, in, you know, turning that maybe it'd be, it'd be nice to go back to have another one of these topical specific episodes where I like can at least illustrate why this is legit and, and the value of it. So here we are with Psalm 24 and Psalm 29. All right. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, let's just jump in here. We got, you know, a good, good bit of ground to cover. I'm going to read Psalm 24. We'll just take them in, in uh, numerical order. And I'm going to read the psalm, and then we'll just drill down into a few particulars. So Psalm 24 begins, and again, this is ESV, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, and the King of glory or that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Now, again, just to drill down into a few things, there's a lot of things that we could talk about, but I, I want to just, again, pinpoint a few of the details that, again, get us into ancient cognate material. And we'll take a few rabbit trails along the way, a few sidebars. But Psalm 24, as you know, a number of commentators have pointed out over the years, you know, in, in their work on the Psalms, and I'm, I'm going to be referencing, you know, a serious commentary, like word biblical commentary. I'm going to quote a few things from that particular volume. But Scholars have pointed out that there's basically three types of Psalter material in this psalm that often characterize entire psalms elsewhere. For instance, verses 1 and 2 is a hymn that uh, praises Yahweh for his establishment of the world and his dominion over it. Verses 3 through 6 is an ascent 
uh, psalm, or at least that portion of it, who shall ascend, verse 3 says, the hill of the Lord. This is sort of a subset of psalms, ascent psalms. Many scholars look for, again, this kind of language as indicating the ascent of a pilgrim up to the temple, again, up Mount Zion, or a psalm after the exile describing a return to Zion. You know, again, it's sort of a geographical reference that we either we're either in the land and we go up to the temple, or we're we're outside the land and in our journey to the land when we hit Jerusalem we ascend up, you know, to to Zion. Uh, the language here might sound anachronistic, uh, but it may not be. And that what I'm getting at, at there is if you're looking at it as sort of a return to Zion psalm, well, then it doesn't make sense to have it a psalm of David because this is well after David. And even the whole idea of, of ascending you know, up to the temple, verse 3, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Again, it, it, it feels like a clear reference to the temple. And when you get to, to verses 7 through 10, the, the doors and the gates, again, the, the, the temple idea, well, there was no temple in David's time. This is a Psalm of David, you know, again, ostensibly. And after the exile, there was no temple either. So what we we have to deal with that. So the language appears anachronistic. You know, the psalm itself could be kind of an editorial composite, you know, later editor wanting to associate the kingship language in the psalm with the house of David. And and that's legit because the 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 English translation a psalm of David is le David mismore. That could just as well mean a psalm or a song for David on behalf of David with respect to David. I mean, it, it doesn't have to mean of David. There are other ways to take that phrase. Uh, If the right context in in view is worship, it may be a reference to ascending to wherever God's house was. In in David's day, that would have been the tabernacle. Uh, The tabernacle is referred to as the Lord's house in Joshua 6.24. For instance, I'll, I'll just read that. They turned the city, or they burned the city with fire, and everything in it, only the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. Now, that's a reference to something happening in the conquest. There is no temple. There's no temple complex. They're not even in you know, the land. So the, the only reference to the house of the Lord there has to be the tabernacle complex. In 1 Samuel 1, nine, you get the same kind of thing. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah arose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. Well, there is no temple. This is Samuel's day. Uh, so the, the reference has to be to the tabernacle. And if we look at it that way, well, then that all of that would align with Davidic authorship, you know, the psalm that, that David actually composed. Uh, for other reasons, again, namely stuff we're going to talk about a little bit later, a, the con, a context of tabernacle prior to the exile is probably preferable anyway. Verses 7 through 10, again, uh, the f- first part was a hymn. The second part is one of these ascent kind of situations. And the third part uh, is, uh, again, a subset of psalms and, uh, and other poetic portions in the Hebrew Bible, and that is the procession of the ark. It, it's some kind of liturgy, you know, a, a, a ceremonial or, or liturgical sort of situation. Uh, Craigie, for instance, uh, in his commentary on, on, in the Word Biblical Commentary series, volume one, he has three, there are three volumes of the psalms. Craigie, uh, was one of the writers. I may, he might have been the only writer of Volume One. The second edition is what I'm going to be quoting from. But he he writes this. He says these verses are associated with a procession of the ark. Again, it is liturgical in form, having a question-response format. The ark bearers' declaration comes in verse seven. Second, the question posed by the gatekeepers of the temple. Uh, again, lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? And again, the gatekeepers would ask. Third, the response of the bears of the ark, you know, well, it's it's the Lord of hosts. He's the King of glory. Fourth, the Craigie notes, the further question of the gatekeepers, uh, you know, continues. Again, they ask actually a series of questions. And, you know, you get this question, answer, back and forth response sort of thing. It's common in liturgical texts is the point. Uh, Craigie notes, the original kind of setting presupposed by such a procession is provided in 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 19. I'll just, I'll just read a little bit of that. And it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. 
So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Again, that, and it just goes and, and describes a little bit of that procession. So you, you have a couple of these scenes in the Hebrew Bible about transporting the ark, moving the ark around. So in this psalm, you, you get kind of all of that packed in to 10 verses. You know, some of these psalm subsets and these specific themes that can really sort of be evident or, or, or frame entire psalms elsewhere in the Psalter. Now, a little sidebar here uh, on the psalm titles and superscriptions. I think it's probably worth uh, mentioning something here. I'm going to reference here the Dictionary of the Old Testament uh, Wisdom and Poetic Books, that particular volume in the IVP uh, series. Uh, the the material on the, on the superscriptions, the psalm titles, is written by D.A. Brueggemann. And he notes this, evangelical scholarship generally attributes significant authority to the titles. Derek Kidner, and he, he wrote a few commentaries in the Tyndale series, Kidner even appears to treat them as inspired and canonical, noting that the New Testament even builds arguments on authorship notes. Uh, again, he has a few New Testament references like Matthew or Mark 12, 35 through 37, uh, Acts 13, 35 through 37, those sorts of things. Well, uh, again, these are a bit problematic, despite, again, the, the, the sort of positive orientation of, in general of evangelical scholarship because of some of the things we've already you know, hinted at. Let, let me just, again, draw from um, you know, some of what Brueggemann says in this dictionary entry about the problems. Number one, some doubt that composing psalms is what one might expect of David when he was hiding in caves and fighting the Philistines. So you have a reference in Psalm 57, 1, uh, which again is supposed to be a psalm of David. And, you know, at that time in David's life, he's like in battle, you know, he's, he's doing military stuff. Uh, there are other psalms like that. And so some people say, well, like, would he really like have time to do this? Well, the answer is, well, he, sure, he could have, because you have there are lots of examples from like World War I, World War II, where people write poems, they write, you know, even portions of books while they're in prison or while they're in the trenches, you know, that, I mean, this, this happens. So the, the circumstances don't specifically rule out uh, David being able to do this. Second, uh, Brueggemann comments, some see historical tension with Old Testament and broader ancient Near Eastern history when, you know, with respect to the titles. Psalm 56 says that David composed it, quote, when the Philistines seized him in Gath, unquote. However, the historical record of the Bible itself says that David took himself, or David, you know, took himself to the king of Gath to escape Saul. In other words, he, he went there. So nobody brought him. He, in effect, brought himself. You know, 1 Samuel 21.10 1 Samuel 27, 1 through 3. So it, it seems like that doesn't really work. However, again, Brueggemann notes, we should note that David began to fear the king of Gath. He feigned insanity and escaped to the cave of Adullam, 1 Samuel 21, 12 through 23, 1. So what, what he means by mentioning that is that, well, you know, maybe he was held there against his will. You know, when he, when he was at Gath, sure, he went there by himself, but maybe there was some problem there that we aren't specifically told about because David very obviously came up with a ruse to get out of Dodge. Uh, so maybe maybe it, it does fit. Several Davidic Psalms, of course, mention the temple. Again, ours is one of them, Psalm 24, before it was actually built. However, the tabernacle, again, could be called the Lord's house, So, as we saw. So that's not, again, a, an insurmountable problem. Third, some say that the third person reference in the Psalm titles, a Psalm of David. Okay, it's like somebody's talking about David seems incongruent with a first-person reference in the psalm itself. So if David was writing it, would he really include the line, a psalm of David? Well, you know, maybe, maybe not. It just seems like somebody else is, is writing it to David or for David. Again, that Le David Mesmore could be translated that way. So, you know, how much should we read into these titles? Uh, and Brueggemann notes that for that reason and others, this, this doesn't necessarily undermine Davidic authorship of these titles. since you know, we could take it in other ways. And sometimes writers do refer to themselves in the third person on occasion. So, you know, what, what do we make of that? Again, it, probably that, you know, if you want to assign a lot of importance to the psalm titles, there's probably a way to get there, you know, and, and have them make sense. But on the other hand, 
you know, there, there are indications that they might be secondary. They might have been added by, by somebody else at a different time period or something. So this, this is why this is sort of a tug and war. It's a minor discussion. It's not really a big uh, deal in Old Testament study. But again, just so that you know why there are two sides to the titles, to the superscriptions. So let's get back to Psalm 24. Again, it begins, you know, with this, you know, declaration of Yahweh's creation and supremacy, and then it goes into this ascent language. Now, essentially, the psalm is about an ascent to worship Yahweh, the creator and Lord of all creation, in his house, whether that's the tabernacle or temple. Wherein is the ark? That's the place or the symbol of Yahweh's presence. The psalm presents Yahweh as king. The basis for his kingship is his creative power and subjugation of the chaos waters. We see the conditions necessary for worshiping the king and what follows, you know, clean hands, pure heart, which refers to disposition, not perfect behavior, which of course is impossible. Someone whose heart inclines away from evil is the point, and toward Yahweh, not towards some other god. Again, clean hands, pure heart. If you if you hear a preacher basically preaching that this this means you you know God requires sinless perfection in your behavior, well you you know feel free to ignore that person because God's not going to require an impossibility. What he's talking about is disposition. The ark procession that follows reminds us of the divine warrior who led Israel into the land by conquest. You know when they go back to the tabernacle, the conquest settings, they're they're traveling with the ark, and of course with the angel and and whatnot. So that's what it reminds me reminds us of this divine warrior thing leading Israel into the land. And you know, therefore, it speaks of Israel as Yahweh's portion in the Deuteronomy 32 worldview among all humanity. Israel was created by Yahweh himself after Babel, and you know, he has chosen a land and that's where they're going. This act again this procession would further remind Israelites that Yahweh is Lord of all nations. Again, he's traveling you know, through these spaces. He's defeating their enemies. Why? Because, well, he actually owns all the nations anyway. He disinherited them and he chose, he created and, and chose Israel for his own. So again, these sorts of things would have been you know, reminders. You know, this kind of language in the psalm would have been reminders to the people listening to it. Now, it's fairly easy to see all that in a more than surface reading. But there are other nuggets that can only be discerned if we were literate Israelites, familiar with Canaanite literature, or even non- or semi-literate Israelites, nevertheless familiar with the stories of Baal and El's counsel from wider Canaanite religion. That's where we want to drill down here. So let's go back to verses 1 and 2. And some of, some of you out there in the audience, again, uh, because of your familiarity with Unseen Realm, you know, my book there and other episodes we've done probably have, have already picked these things out, at least these two. Listen to the verses. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas. The Hebrew term there is yamim. The lemma is yam. Okay, store that away. Yam means sea. In Hebrew, the plural is yamim. He has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. The word is neharot. The lemma is nahar. So remember, yam and nahar. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell in it. Why? Because he has founded that world. He, he created it. He founded the world upon yam and upon nahar. So he has mastered, he has brought order by creating an inhabitable world. And he has put it on the back, so, as, so, so to speak. He has, he has nestled it on top of, put it on the back of Yam and Nahar. I'm going to read you a little section from Craigie's commentary here, just, just so that you know that what I'm going to say and, and what follows isn't just Mike making stuff up. I mean, this is, this is scholarship 101 for people who do Old Testament and Semitics. Okay, so Craigie, from his commentary, again, second edition, First Psalms volume in the Word Biblical series. He writes, The hymn begins with an affirmation of the Lord's dominion over the created world and its inhabitants. That dominion is based upon the fact that God himself fixed and established the world. At first sight, it appears as if the language of verse 2 reflects primitive cosmology. The world, like a floating saucer, is anchored upon the seas. 
Yet the language is more profound and contains within it a transformation of Canaanite Ugaritic cosmology, or cosmogony, excuse me. Yam, literally sea, who is also called Nahar, literally river, represented a threat to order in Canaanite mythology. The conquest of Yam by Baal represented the subjugation of chaotic forces and the establishment of Baal's kingship. The Hebrew poet, using the terms Yam and Nahar in a demythologized and depersonified sense, depicts forcefully the Lord's creation of an ordered world upon seas and rivers, symbolizing the subdued forces of chaos. The symbolism of the language is significant. Just as in the underlying Ugaritic myth, the conquest of Yam culminated in kingship. So too, the Lord's creative work, as described here, is linked with his kingship in verses 7 through 10, who is this king of glory. Now, this is a good example of a polemic response to Baal theology. Okay? Uh, this is me now. We, we've, we just ended uh, Craigie's quote. And this is a good example of this kind of thing that we talk about on the podcast a lot, you know, the ancient Near Eastern polemic. Uh, in this case of Baal theology, it's not Baal who brought order out of chaos. It isn't Baal who keeps the waters of chaos at bay. Baal is not Lord. Yahweh is. Baal was called king of the gods at Ugarit, and he's the, the co-ruler with El. But Yahweh is king, not Baal. Now, another, a, a little sidebar here again. There is a propensity, even among evangelical Old Testament scholars, to think only in terms of Mesopotamia and not Canaanite literature when it comes to creation language in these sorts of psalms, these sorts of instances. Now, I'm bringing this up because occasionally I'll get a note you know, about uh, maybe something John Walton says or somebody else and sounds a little different than what I'm saying. And one of the reasons is, is that Walton, for some reason, is, you know, he, he's sort of fixed on Mesopotamian material. That, that's kind of his default, what he looks for. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why, but maybe, maybe he just likes that more. But I'm going to read you something from uh, Longman's book, Tremper Longman, uh, in his book, Psalms, An Introduction and Commentary, also InterVarsity Press. And he, he's quoting Walton, referring to Walton here in this psalm, Psalm 24. This is just to illustrate. Contrary to ancient Mesopotamian creation accounts, and he quotes Walton, he gives, a, he gives a, a reference there. Contrary to ancient Mesopotamian creation accounts, though, there is not a hint of conflict between the Lord and the sea in the description of creation. And then he adds, but see Psalm 74. So, you know, good for Tremper there. Uh, so what? You know, we, we, don't, we don't need to have Mesopotamian material like the Tiamat battle from Enuma Elish, uh, whether that is, is the point of Genesis 1, 1 through 3 or not. We don't, we don't really need it. You, that could actually be Ugaritic as well because of Tahome and then the, the etymology of that. It doesn't matter. We do indeed have conflict, chaos, kampf, okay, is the German term, in these passages, but it doesn't come from Mesopotamia. It comes from Canaanite literature. It comes from Ugaritic literature. And in this commentary, there's no word about Canaanite material. Now, I point this out again because sometimes evangelicals don't see ancient Near Eastern connections clearly, or they don't draw attention to them because they're fixated on Mesopotamia. Well, our, our eyes sometimes need to move away from Mesopotamia. Again, this, this is the kind of thing that creates a bit of a disconnect between the way Walton talks about the divine council and divine beings and the way I do. He's always looking for parallels in Mesopotamia, and if he doesn't find them, and he says, oh, we can't say this about that, this or that about the divine council. And my objection is, why, why, why should we care if we have Mesopotamian parallels? The better parallels are Ugaritic, and they're clear, and there's a bunch of them. So, again, I just want to point this out because it, it's not, you know, I don't really know why. I mean, John is certainly aware of this material, uh, but he has this propensity to filter the Old Testament material through Mesopotamia. Uh, and I, I think in some cases that makes a lot of sense to do. In other cases, it really doesn't make any sense to do. And you're going to miss some things and you're gonna, you're gonna, your attention is going to be deflected away from certain things that are important. So again, I, I, just, I just thought I'd point that out because I do get you know, some questions on that. So back to the psalm again. 
Let's go to verses 7 through 10. We talked in verses 1 and 2 about you have two clear references to Baal's conflict with Yom and Nahar. And, and in, in the Ugaritic Canaanite religion, Baal has this battle with Yom, again, who is also called Nahar, you know, with sea and rivers, okay? He has this battle, and he, and he defeats Yom, and the result of that is Baal becomes king in the, in the Canaanite, the Ugaritic story. First two verses are a clear allusion to this. And again, Baal isn't the king. Baal isn't the one who subdues chaos. Baal doesn't do any of this stuff. It's Yahweh, and it sets up what follows. So you, know, you have this king deity. You've got this creator deity. How should we approach him? Well, verses three through six, with clean hands and a pure heart. And that, that's what he wants. You know, he doesn't, he's not talking about perfected performance. He wants a disposition that seeks him as God and seeks righteousness. Even though we're humans, we're going to fail. But this is the orientation, the disposition of our hearts. And once his blessing, you know, once that relationship that does not follow some other God. And then you hit verses seven through 10. Craigie, again, just to, to another little note from his work, kingship of God is the central theme in the last section of the Psalm, verses seven through 10. The basic concept involved was in, in no sense unique to Hebrew theology. For many ancient Near Eastern nations attributed the role of kingship to their deities. The kingship of Baal following his conquest of Yom was central to Ugaritic mythology. Again, and we see how the Hebrew writer, the Israelite writer, the biblical writer, is shooting at Baal in the first two verses. Well, he's going to shoot at Baal again in verses 7 through 10, because he's already answered his own questions here in 7 through 10, you know, who's the king of glory? He's already answered that in verses 1 and 2. So Baal's going to get his nose rubbed in it again in verses 7 through 10. Now, the key phrases here that would have made literate Israelites or someone really familiar with, you know, Ugaritic religion. There are key phrases that would have made their ears perk up, and they are, lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, O ancient doors. You say, what in the world is that? Well, just hang on. Baal's victory, again, over Yom and Nahar has a context of its own. His victories ensure his status as king of the gods. That's what he wins when he defeats Yom, Yom slash Nahar, okay? Now, that section of the Baal cycle in which that battle occurs, and, and again, it's set up by a particular scene in El's council, that section of the Baal cycle is about kingship. The whole, the whole section of the Baal cycle there is about establishing Baal as king of the gods. So let's read some of that, some of the Baal cycle, and see if it sounds a little familiar. And I'm going to read from Nicholas Wyatt's translation from his, his book, Religious Texts from Ugarit. This is the second edition. And as far as the Baal cycle uh, reference, this is going to be KTU uh, 2.1, uh, line 17 through 28, also known as CTA 2, again, 2-1, two line 17 through 28. So here's, let's just read, again, some, read through this, this section of the Baal cycle. The message of Yom, your master. So let me just stop there, the first line. The scene is, Yom has sent messengers, Malachim, okay, to El's council. And specifically, he's going to be obliquely, these messengers are going to be obliquely talking to Baal, because Baal has emerged as a rival. So when he says, message of Yom, or actually it's, it's more than one messenger, but they say, message of Yom, your master. Okay, Yom is king of the gods now. And again, Baal has emerged as a competitor. Uh, so it just sets the tone right off the bat. Message of Yom, your master, of your lord, ruler, Nahar. Give up the god whom you obey. So he's speaking to the divine council, and, and Baal is among you know, the group, okay? And, and so he's really talking to Baal, but he's speaking to the whole group. So he says to the—the the, the gods are going to be in the scene a little bit in a few lines. He's speaking to the group and says, give up the god whom you obey. Now, Wyatt has a footnote here. As king among the gods, Yom's legal right to their obedience is beyond question. It is not clear why Baal is the god whom the others obey, unless they are plotting rebellion, perpetuating an older loyalty, or already anticipating a future developments. Again, it, it, it suggests that there's, there's some sort of coup being planned. 
And Yom is aware of it. So he sends his messages and says, hey, surrender to me, the God that you guys are obeying. It's a challenge. And then he, he adds, surrender the one whom you obey, and then the word tempest. Uh, it's interesting, it, it, Wyatt in this, at this point, uh, he points out what the Ugaritic word is. It's H-M-L-T. And, he's, and the, the Hebrew parallel is uh, hamula, storm, or you could understand this word as referring to multitudes. Wyatt writes, the form HMLT appearing in KTU 1.1315 and parallels is still appropriately translated multitudes, even though the etymology may be the same. It refers to a vast crowd. So that's probably the better way to take this. Like, you know, surrender to me the God whom you obey, the, the one whom you obey, you multitude. You know, in other words, you, you, you counsel, you multitude of, of supernatural beings here. Cough him up surrender him to me. This, this is a, a big confrontation. And then it, the, the bail cycle keeps going. Give up Baal and his retinue, the son of Dagon, whose gold I shall seize. The divine assistants depart. They do not delay. Then they set their faces towards the divine mountain, towards the convocation of the council. Uh, so again, this is, this is sort of a, a flashback. And then the, the scene, again, transitions again to, to where this, this challenge is, is going to be or is issued. Now, the gods were sitting down to eat, the sons of the holy ones to die, and Baal stood by El. Lo, the gods saw them. They saw the messengers of Yom, the embassy of ruler Nahar. And the gods lowered their heads onto their knees, onto the thrones of their princeships, and Baal rebuked them. Why, O gods? Have you lowered your heads onto your knees and onto the thrones of your princeships? I see, gods, that the tablets of Yom's messengers, and they came with an official message, of the embassy of ruler Nahar are humiliating you. Lift up, O gods, your heads from on your knees, from the thrones of your princeships, and I shall answer the messengers of Yom, the embassy of ruler Nahar. So Baal accepts the challenge. And he tells the, the, the gods of the council, who are like cowering, like, oh, we're in trouble now because Yom knows what's going on. Lift up your heads from, a, you know, from your knees. The, the, as the cycle continues, again, the section continues, Yom messengers demand Baal, again, be turned over to him. And El says, okay, which really ticks Baal off. And he responds by attacking the messengers. And then you have a, a section that's missing about 120 lines. And when, when, when the text returns to what we actually have, Baal is actually fighting Yom himself, and he kills him, okay? And he becomes king of the gods. So if you think about it, when Baal shows up, the gods lower their heads onto their knees. They cringe at Baal's rebuke. They're afraid. And they basically put their heads between their knees, okay? The, the, they put their heads onto the thrones of their princeships. They're, they're putting their heads between their knees. I mean, it, they're getting as, as tight and low as they possibly can. They're apparently afraid that they are undone. Yom is angry. They have been under Baal's lordship, not Yom's, and now they're in trouble. Now, all that, of course, assumes Yom is the greater deity. They think Baal's going to get his clock cleaned, and they're going to be in trouble. Baal tells them to knock it off or buck up. He commands that they lift up their heads and stop being fearful. He is large and in charge, again, like, like we would say, some of us would say anyway. So what's the point? Well, the language of the Baal cycle, where Baal becomes king of the gods, is repurposed by the psalmist in Psalm 24, verses 7 through 10, to declare the kingship of Yahweh. It has some subtle changes and applications. So let's read verses 7 through 10 again and be thinking about that scene in the Baal cycle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? It's Yahweh, strong and mighty, Yahweh, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Now, a couple items of, in, of interest. You know, rhetorically, who's the king of glory? Well, it ain't Baal. <laughs> it's not Baal. It's Yahweh. Again, if you, if you know the Baal story and you read this psalm or you hear it, 
you, you, your ear is going to catch you know, similarities in phrases. The difference, of course, is this lift up your heads, O gates, O everlasting doors, instead of lift up your heads, O gods. Why the change from gods to gates or doors? What does it signify? Well, it signifies a couple things. Again, I'll just for the sake of time, I'm going to limit the discussion here. It signifies there is no need to single out the members of Yahweh's council because they fear no other god. The context is different here. Okay, you don't have gods in Yahweh's council plotting to, you know, to, to side with some other deity. All right, so, so that, that is not in the picture. They don't fear any, other, any of their own membership. They, are, they fear the Lord. They fear Yahweh. Okay, they fear no other god as being more powerful than Yahweh. So the, the threat element is not there. And second, recall that the context of verses 7 through 10 biblically is the procession of the Ark of the Covenant, the throne or footstool, depending on what passage you're in, of Yahweh. And again, that, all that also throne or footstool depends on whether we're talking about tabernacle or temple. The gates and doors speak of the tabernacle or temple entrances. In biblical descriptions, there's no other deity in this localized, earthly, sacred space. You bring the ark in, there's no other deities in there. The ark is the throne or the footstool of one, one deity. That's Yahweh. Other gods, even other council members, are not in view there. There's no need to bring them into the scene because Yahweh is the only one who sits enthroned on Zion. And so there's a there's a there's a, a theological and logical reason why the language has changed a bit, but it clearly draws on the Baal cycle. Verses one and two clearly drew on the Baal cycle. Again, the the the, the combat element there, the challenge that that's issued by Yom, also known as Nahar, to Baal. You know where Baal becomes king of the gods when he defeats Yom. And in verses one and two, it, it's Yahweh who who is over Yom. Yahweh is the one who is, is Lord over Yom you know, and, and Nahar. It's not Baal. Then you get to verses 7 to 10 where it's talking about kingship, and you have this lift up your heads language. Again, it, it's that part is word for word you know, from the Baal cycle. So again, literate Israelites would have picked up on this, and this is the way they, they are able to be taught or learn or even picture in their minds correct theology. That's the point. That's why the writers do this. They are picking a fight. They are blackening the eye. They are rubbing the nose of Baal, you know, in something. It's, it's in this material. This is, this is a, a sideswipe, you know, a theological sideswipe. But it's easy for us to just read right over that stuff and think, well, that's kind of goofy talk. Or, oh, that reminds me of Handel's Messiah. Well, good, but, you know, <laughs> there's still something else going on here. Now, let's, again, quickly go to Psalm 29. Again, we're just illustrating these points. And by the way, I didn't insert anything into Psalm 24. The language is already there, and it, and it is parallel to language somewhere else in some other literature. I'm not saying, oh, there's holes in this psalm. Boy, it would be nice if there was a few lines from the Baal cycle in here. Let's put those in. Okay, we're not doing that. And, and again, most of my audience is obviously going to know that. But again, just for the sake of making the comment, there it is. Let's read Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, and it's the divine name, and this is also as a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to Yahweh, O heavenly beings, B'nai Elim. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. 
May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. That's Psalm 29. Now, by way of setup, I'm going to use Craigie again because he has some nice opening comments here and gets us into some things we, we at least ought to mention. Psalm 29 is a hymn. The whole thing is a hymn. It contains three basic parts. One, the call to praise, verses 1 and 2, which is addressed to the sons of God. Two, the praise of the Lord's voice, verses 3 to 9, voice of the Lord mentioned many times there. Three, a concluding section describing the praise of the Lord in the temple, verses 10 and 11. Again, very easy to plot that out. What has drawn attention, of course, is Canaanite Ugaritic elements, and Craigie comments, the Canaanite Ugaritic aspects of the, of the psalm form the basis of a hypothesis presented by Ginsburg in 1935, in which he proposed that Psalm 29 may originally, that's a key word, may originally have been a Phoenician hymn. Now, you know, Ginsburg's theory, I just want to say something about it, because this is the kind of thing that, you know, is going to make internet theology headlines, you know, oh, Psalm 29, really, from the Phoenician. Yeah, nice. Thanks for the clickbait. Um, Ginsburg's Phoenician orientation is due to the proximity of Phoenicia to the topographical references in verses 5 and 6, Lebanon, Syrian, okay? That's right, adjacent to Phoenician territory. Um, you know, and he used that to argue that Psalm 29 was originally a Phoenician hymn modified by the psalmist for inclusion in the Psalter. Now, Craigie and others, and Craigie's certainly not alone here, disputes that. It, 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 it's really an overreach of the data. And I think Craigie's summary of the issue is fair. I'll read it to you Yeah, you know, just a sentence or two. Craigie says, it is clear that there are sufficient parallels and similarities to require a Canaanite background to be taken into account in developing the interpretation of the psalm. But it is not clear that those parallels and similarities require one to posit a Canaanite Phoenician original of Psalm 29. That's unquote. And to me, that's entirely fair. I mean, just because there's similarities doesn't mean that there's a, a, a point of origin here. Why not argue that for Psalm 24? I mean, you know, Ginsburg didn't argue that for Psalm 24 and other Psalms. I mean, it's just, it, it overreaches the data. It overstates the case. But you may see it somewhere. So on to a few observations. Again, in verses 1 and 2, as Craigie pointed out, you have a call to worship. And the sons of God are, are, the, are the ones that are being spoken to. The B'nai Elim, they are called to worship Yahweh. In effect, think about this. In effect, in verses 1 to 2, the congregation of Israelites who would be singing this psalm in worship, okay, are calling upon the members of the divine council to join them in the praise of Yahweh. Okay, it's kind of kind of cool, you know. As I point out in Unseen Realm, this is one of those verses that again shows very clearly the subservient status and the the subservient or the lesser ontology of the members of the divine council compared to Yahweh. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. What makes Yahweh unique and, and the, the faith of the Israelite writers, the biblical writers, in the uniqueness of Yahweh, the one God among other gods, is that is, you know, it has nothing to do with the term Elohim. What, it, what, what distinguishes him is the way that one Elohim is talked about and described elsewhere, that no other, other Elohim are. And this is one of those instances. You'll never have... And, and I would I would challenge anyone you know to to come up with some data that would suggest that a biblical writer would think that Yahweh ought to be worshiping some other deity. No, it, it's never the other way around. It's always ascribed to the Lord, O heavenly beings, you Bene Elim, you sons of God in the council, you know, bow the knee. It's never the other way around. So again, this is one example of, of having really a data less position to argue that Yahweh was interchangeable with other gods in the council. That's actually what polytheism says. Um, you know, and, and even henotheism assumes that. Biblical writers did not think that way. There's, there's no data to suggest that they did. Now, Craigie, again, is going to you know, sort of build off this and, and, and riff off this, and he's going to spend a lot of time talking about the voice of Yahweh in verses 3 to 9. But he says this, the background to this psalm is to be found in language associated with Baal and his holy voice. Okay. Baal, the Canaanite weather god, was associated with the storm, thunder, and lightning. Doesn't that sound like verse 3? The god of glory thunders. Doesn't that sound, you know, a little bit later? Let me read it to you again. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. Again, this, that's elsewhere. That's going to be regular, you know, regular language 
regular description for lightning. Okay. Um, you know, so back to Craigie. Baal, the Canaanite weather god, was associated with storm, thunder, and lightning. He is portrayed in Ugaritic iconography with lightning as a weapon in his hand. In the Ugaritic text, his voice is explicitly identified with thunder. His, you know, he has a Canaanite reference there, you know, CTA 4.7, 29 to 31. But the psalmist, who rejects the possibility of any real power of Baal over weather or the outcome of battle, adapts the language of storm and integrates it with his description of God's glory, of Yahweh's glory. It's the end of the Craigie quote. So the praise in the psalm begins with an affirmation that the Lord's voice is upon the waters. Again, it, it's, it's in the, the superior posture position, okay? You know, he's over the waters. At a primary level of interpretation, the words might be taken to imply the psalmist is describing a thunderstorm at sea, perhaps a storm approaching the land from that sea. Does that sound familiar? Again, if you've read, I, I think it's in Bible Unfiltered, my little, my little essay for Bible Study Magazine about the ancient Israelite context of Jesus walking on the waters, calming the storm. You get the idea, okay? Again, at a primary level of interpretation, it might be a storm approaching, okay? But the undertones, this is, again, just, I'm just trying to flesh this out a little bit. The undertones of the language go deeper and, again, reflect an adaptation of Canaanite or Ugaritic religious thought. In the Ugaritic text, Yom, C is the god of the mighty waters. Again, Craigie is just sort of summarizing Craigie here. He gives another reference to the uh, Ugaritic tablets there. Yet the chaotic god Yam was conquered by Baal. An allusion to this mythological incident is already contained in the Song of the Sea, where the Lord is described as using sea, Yam, as a tool of conquest. In Psalm 29.3, the Lord is described not merely as a deity whose thunderous voice is heard, but as one victorious over the chaotic forces, symbolized by the many waters. The poetry amplifies the theme of the Lord as warrior. Again, that's also you know material from Craigie. That you know, again, I'm just trying to summarize some of his thoughts because they're you know they're important. They they just sort of set the stage for something that I want to jump into now. We we read a little bit of the Baal cycle with Psalm 24. Let's read a little bit of the Baal cycle for this one. Okay, now think about the voice of Baal, and again this this flashing lightning and you know all this kind of even this the cedar forest and the waters and the thunders and all that stuff. Okay, this part of the Baal cycle is concerned with the fact that Baal doesn't have a temple of his own. And so he, there's this sort of, again, r roughly speaking, there's sort of a campaign you know, uh, to get Baal his own temple. Baal wants his own house, you know, and he's not happy until he gets one. So, um, you know, some of, the, some of the members of the council go to bat for him. You know, they have to get approval from El to do this, so, but they they... They're on Baal's side. He, he, he needs a temple. He needs a house. So with that in mind, let me just read you a, a little bit again of the Baal cycle. Let a house be built for Baal like the gods, and a dwelling like the sons of Athirat. And the great lady who tramples Yam replied, <laughs> this is going to be, uh, I'm trying to remember if this is, uh, you know, I think it's Athirat that gets that title. The great lady who tramples Yam replied, you are great, O El. So she's beseeching El now to get permission to build this, this house for Baal. The grayness of your beard does indeed make you wise. You know, she's sucking up to him. The knowledge in your breast does indeed instruct you. And now the season of his reigns may Baal indeed appoint. You know, but ba Baal is in charge of the, of the reign, and we don't want to get him off schedule here. He's distracted by not having a house. So the season of his reigns may Baal indeed appoint. The season of his storm chariot and the sound of his voice from the clouds. There's the, the voice of Baal idea his hurling to the earth of lightning flashes. A house of cedars, let them build for him, and let them build him a house of bricks. Now, Anat gets involved in the discussion. Virgin Anat rejoiced. She stamped her feet. She likes the idea, and the earth shook. Then she set her face towards Baal in the heights of Zaphon. Again, Zaphon in Ugaritic is Zaphon in Hebrew, the north. A thousand miles away, 10,000 leagues off, Virgin Anat laughed. She lifted up her voice and cried, Rejoice, Baal, good news I bring. A house will be given to you like your brothers, and a dwelling like your kinsmen. Okay? So she's happy. Okay? Now let's look at verses 3 through 9 again in, in light of that scene. So you have 
you know, again, I can't remember if it's Athirat or not in the earlier section could be, uh, brings the request, you know, to L, butters him up a little bit. L is going to wind up saying, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Bale is going to get his house, but, you know, again, she, you know, Anad is thrilled with the news and she's going to go back and, and tell Bale and, and the way she describes him, again, he's, he's in the heights of Safon, the north. You know, we've got the description of his voice from the clouds, hurling to earth, lightning flashes, the house of cedars and all this kind of stuff. She's thrilled. Now let's go to verses three through nine again in Psalm 29. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. I mean, he is Lord over Yom, over, over, over the waters just generally. We don't have the nest, we don't have the word Yom here, but just waters generally. And as things are going to pick up at the end of Psalm 29, we're going to we're going to see a reference to the flood again over over the world. That's really what the waters are, and, it, and that denotes kingship over the entire world. So instead of Baal being king of the world, you know, because he's king of the gods, no. In verse three, the voice of the Lord, voice of Yahweh, is over the waters. It's where he lives. That's where he speaks from. The God of glory is the one who thunders. And it's a, it's a direct borrowing of, of the thunder language from Baal. The Lord is over the many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. And these are clear allusions to Baal imagery, but it's Yahweh who is being described, not Baal. Verse 5, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Ouch. Yahweh is so powerful, he breaks the cedars. The stuff that Baal's house is made out of. In other words, Baal's house wouldn't last very long. Okay, it's vulnerable. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. Now, can an Ugaritate Canaanite thinking, this is the far north, and this is where Baal lives. This is his turf. This is, this is his territory. Okay? Syrian is interesting, especially because that's a clear allusion to Mount Hermon, the Hermon region in the northern area of Phoenician rule. Remember, Baal was the, was the big dude in Phoenician religion. Remember? Jezebel, okay, uh, Ahab and Jezebel worshiping Baal. She brings Baal worship in Israel. Okay, th this is his turf, and it's like Yahweh's just his voice is all that it's needed to just smash the place to bits. And Sirion is the name used for Mount Hermon by the people of Sidon, which is again, you know, in the north there with with the Phoenicians. In Deuteronomy three nine, I'll just read you a few references. It says the Sidonians call Hermon Sirion while the Amorites call it Sanir. Deuteronomy 4, 48. From Arower, which is on the edge of the valley of Arnon, as far as Mount Sirion, that is, Mount Hermon. So it's, it's very clear, you know, where, what this is being directed toward. Again, Sirion is really a specific point of reference, Hermon, this whole region, you know, the, the, the forests of Lebanon and all that. Verse 7, the voice of the Lord, the voice of Yahweh, flashes forth flames of fire. It isn't Baal you know, who sends fire from heaven. Okay, it's the voice of Yahweh. It's not the voice of Baal. The, the lightning doesn't come because Baal speaks. It comes because you know the Lord speaks. I mean, this these are His weapons, not Baal's. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. You know, you you actually could have a double reference here, with the fire maybe being a reference to the burning bush in the Exodus. Again, Yahweh coming from the, the southern region, Kadesh here. Uh, again, it, it could take you know the reader's mind back to that material as well. Verse nine: The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth, <laughs> and strips the forest bare. Now somebody should make a meme out of that, honestly. You know, at, at the shout of God, the deer just drop their young, <laughs> and the forests are just stripped bare. Uh, I'd say cartoon. You know, we don't want to make it cartoonish, but that would make a good meme. Verse ten: The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. So again, to think of the, the cosmology, you've got this, this dome you know, over the earth, you've got waters above, again, reference to, to, to Genesis 1, you know, 1, 6, and 7, that separate the waters, the waters above, or, the, or the, the, you separate the, the waters above from the waters below by the firmament. The firmament is called heaven, the skies. So you have these waters above, and that's the domain of God, the domain of Yahweh. Uh, you know, it isn't Baal who is above the waters or who had subdued the waters, is in charge of this stuff. And, and since the dome covers the entire earth, it covers all the nations. 
So who's king of the world? Well, if in Canaanite Ugaritic religion, it's Baal. In Psalm 29, it's like, oh, pardon us, but no. And Baal gets picked on through the whole psalm. And the conclusion is, it's Yahweh who sits enthroned over the flood. It's Yahweh who sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. You know, shalom. Uh, again, the, the whole psalm you know, just, just lifts this little things, again, out of the Canaanite Ugaritic context, specifically out of the Baal context, and burns Baal with them you know, by doing so. Again, this, this is how these things operate. Now, another little sidebar here. Uh, this is going to, uh, again, uh, address something that you know, sometimes I get an email on I, or you know, some, some point of contact here. Uh, you'll, those of you who um, are going to be familiar with, with some of the things I'll refer to here will know why I'm bringing this up. And I'll try to explain it to those who, who, to whom this might be new. But I, I'm going to cite a little bit or read a little bit from one of my articles. And the article is from the Bulletin of Biblical Research, the first one I did, uh, volume 18, number one, 2008. It's called Monotheism, Polytheism, Monolatry, or Henotheism Toward an Assessment of Divine Plurality in the Hebrew Bible. Um, you know, the idea that Yahweh is king over all the earth is, according to the critical consensus scholarly opinion, a late Israelite idea that emerged once the evolution to monotheism out of polytheism had taken place. Let me repeat that. I mean, there. You know, there's the, the critical consensus says that Israelite religion, including the, the theology of the biblical writers, evolved from polytheism to monotheism. And when, and when they finally got the enlightened monotheistic view in their heads, then they had to, they had to kill off the other gods because we don't believe they're real anymore. And, and they, they'll say that's what Psalm 82 is about. You, you kill off the gods, and, and now you have Yahweh over all the nations. And so Yahweh is king over the nations. And, and they wouldn't be thinking about that unless they had evolved out of polytheism. And, and you know, we, we want to date all this material late, even though there's really no way to do that. Basically, it's circular reasoning. Well, we're going to date this psalm late because we think the idea is late. Therefore, the psalm must be late. That's how it's done. Okay, that, unfortunately, that's how critical consensus scholarship is done. And I, you know, I, my dissertation at Wisconsin, Madison, I specifically argued against this, that this was circular reasoning. It's, it's illogical. Because there's so much that comes after that takes the quote-unquote presumed polytheistic language that they suppose, supposedly got rid of and evolved away from. It shows up in lots of places later. Well, like, what happened there? Nobody got the memo or, or what? In other words, this neat picture about evolution from polytheism to monotheism that supposedly, you know, finally reached its, its apex moment, you know, either maybe during the exile or a little bit after the exile, because the exile had to beat the polytheism out of the, out of the Jews and all that kind of stuff, you know, that, 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 you know, from that point on, we're, we are intolerant monotheists, you know, we're, we're never going back to this other God's crap, you know, we're just not doing that. Well, why do you have 180 references to plural Elohim or Elim in the Dead Sea Scrolls? You know, a dozen or so of which are clearly overtly in divine counsel context. That that that's supposed to be pre-exilic, primitive religion, primitive polytheism, and the Israel the biblical writers eventually you know broke through and they saw the light of monotheism. I, you know, honestly, I just think it's hokum. I mean, I, I, that might be a little harsh. I, I I think it's illogical. I think it implodes on itself. It does not conform to a lot of data. It, it conforms only to selective data. You know, if you exclude some of the other stuff that gets in the way, well, then you have a nice picture. I don't think we should do that. Uh, but, you know, by way of a, I, why do you mention it? I mention this now because, you know, I've gotten a few emails like, you know, hey, have you, have you listened to Pete Enns' podcast, you know, where he just had Mark Smith on, you know, and they're, they're talking about this stuff. And Mark Smith is, is the, the, the main voice. And, and, He's not a he's not an anti Christian guy. He, he's Mark is a Catholic. I've had several conversations with him. He's 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 really a nice guy, and I think he's a good car, good hearted guy too. Um, but he he is the the main spokesperson for the consensus view. Okay, and and I just I just don't buy it. And, and Mark knows that. I mean, we've you know we've been at the same conferences. I even read a paper where he sat in on, which was a lot of fun because basically we took the whole Q and A time to go back and forth. You know, over the whole thing, but but and he's he's just he's just a nice guy about all that. This is what academics do. But you know, when you have sort of 
I think there's a propensity in some circles of evangelicalism to think that if critical scholars take a position, that's the only position that's coherent. That's the only position that makes sense because they're scholars and, and our scholars, you know, have, maybe have an axe to grind or maybe they're con too confessional or so. They, oh, they're afraid to go. No, this is a scholar that isn't afraid to go there. And yeah, I could, I could file this into the progressive revelation bucket like some evangelicals do. You know, God doesn't have to reveal everything about himself to all the biblical writers the same way at the same time. I get it. I could file it under progressive revelation and say, okay, you know, some of the early biblical writers, maybe they were polytheists, then they, eventually they weren't. I don't because it just doesn't make any sense. The logic of it implodes. Let me give you one anecdote. Again, maybe you know, somebody who you know, heard that other podcast you know, will we'll listen to this. I was in my last semester at the UW-Madison. Okay, we're in, a, in an Isaiah seminar. Second Isaiah was, was the title of it. And Second Isaiah is supposed to be, again, this moment, this apex moment of the breakthrough to monotheism. Okay, and so one day we had Peter Machinist in, who was the, the Hancock Professor of Oriental Languages at Harvard, and, and another just super guy, okay? Just, just a, a really, really pleasant guy, really, really likable. And of course, a, a top-notch scholar, and he is viewed as sort of the the scholar for Second Isaiah. So he's in in you know teaching our our grad seminar that day, and in between the, the two sessions, we're sitting around the table, and I was you know mulling over a dissertation topic, and and Peter Machinist asked, well you know where are you at in the program? And I told him you know I got to take prelims or you know in the summer in a few weeks, and then got to nail down the dissertation topic, and you know so on and so forth. And and I said you know I have a question. Because, I, again, I had been thinking about what to do as a topic. I said, you know, if there's this neat evolution from polytheism to monotheism that culminates in, in, the, in the time of Second Isaiah, why do we get so many references to divine plurality, plural Elohim, plural Elim, in divine council settings? That, 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 you know, in other words, all the pre-exilic language, why does it show up so in, in later texts so frequently? You know, and again, it's citing there, there's like 180 of these in the Dead Sea Scrolls alone. Why, why is that if we have this evolution? And he looked at me, and I'll be forever grateful for this. He looked at me and he said, you know, I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> and, and that was the moment for me. You know, and I, I'm just, I'm, I was blessed by his honesty, his candor and his honesty. That was the moment for me where I thought, okay, I got my topic. It doesn't make any sense to me. And let's go back to Psalm 24. I'm going to give you another reason why it doesn't make any sense from this psalm. Now, again, you have this idea of this trajectory, this evolutionary trajectory, and the, the idea that Yahweh is king of all the nations, which means he has to get rid of all the other gods because you know the gods are over the nations, Deuteronomy 32 and all that stuff. We've got to get rid of those guys so that Yahweh can be the only god over all the nations. That's a late idea. They had to evolve toward that. After, you know, during or after the exile. That's, that's what we're told. Okay, well, Psalm 29 is, by everybody's account, pre-exilic. In fact, Psalm 24, Psalm 29, and Exodus 15 are among the earliest Hebrew Bible material, according to the you know, consensus critical scholars. And, and you know, most of these guys, not all of them, are going to be non-confessional. They don't, they don't take any sort of theology position at all. So what do we have at the end of Psalm 29? You know, how is it that we're saying that before the exile, Yahweh wasn't king over the nations? <laughs> because that's what Psalm 29 says. Psalm 29 is part of this. I'm going to read you uh, bottom of page three and some of page four of my BBR article. I'm going to just read this section. I'm talking about Psalm 82 in the context. So concerning the idea that polytheism is being re used rhetorically in Psalm 82, that, you know, we're, we're killing off the gods here. Much is made of the last verse in that psalm, where God is asked to rise up and possess the nations, Psalm 82. 8. This is interpreted as a new idea of the psalmist to encourage the exilic community that despite exile, Yahweh will rise up and take the nations as his own, having sentenced the other gods to death. Okay, so, so this is a new idea. This view ignores pre-exilic texts such as Psalm 24 and 29, long recognized as some of the most ancient material in the canon. 
For example, Psalm 29.1 contains plural imperatives directed at the B'nai Elim, pointing to a divine council context. Verse 10 declares, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. In Israelite cosmology, the flood upon which Yahweh sat was situated over the solid dome that covered the round flat earth. Since it cannot coherently be asserted that the author would assert that Gentile nations were not under the dome and the flood, this verse reflects the idea of world kingship. The Song of Moses, also among the oldest poetry in the Hebrew Bible, echoes the thought, the same thought. In Exodus 15, 18, the text reads, The Lord will reign forever and ever. As Frank Moore Cross noted over 30 years ago, and Cross was the guy that, that Machinists replaced at Harvard, Cross wrote, quote, The kingship of the gods is a common theme in early Mesopotamian and Canaanite epics. The common scholarly position that the concept of Yahweh reigning or as king is a relatively late development in Israelite thought seems untenable, unquote. And I would agree. I would absolutely agree. So the point is, in Israelite cosmology, the flood waters above the earth, the waters above the firmament, in Genesis 1, 6 through 8 language there, and those waters that presumed, you know, the, a dome covering the entire earth, not just Israel, but the entire earth, okay, that framework means that we have here in Psalm 29 a claim to world kingship over the nations. And of course, that means over their gods. You know, again, <laughs> The, the evolutionary arc narrative, you know, an ARC, the, the, the evolutionary arc from polytheism to monotheism and lumping the biblical writers in there, to me, just does not account for a number of data points, which is why I, I, I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. And, and some people who correspond with me are disturbed, you know, by, by the, well, we have an evangelical saying about talking about this evolution. You know, yeah, they're going to talk about it because that's the consensus view. And to be honest with you, I really don't think they've spent much time looking at the data that don't conform to it and that really undermine the evolutionary trajectory. Again, I could put this in the, in the progressive revelation bucket. That's easy. But I don't because it just doesn't make sense. So I wanted to throw that in as a sidebar. Again, we, we're, we're wrapping up here. So these two Psalms, again, I think have, have value, not necessarily for getting us into the sidebar talk, although I'm sure somebody out there in the audience is going to find that useful or interesting. Um, Psalm 24, Psalm 29, these are good examples of, if you're aware, again, of the Canaanite Ugritic material, you can get a lot more out of these psalms. And again, these aren't unique. There's, there's a lot of other stuff, obviously, in the Hebrew Bible like this and in the Psalter itself. But I wanted to have a place where I could at least sort of try to illustrate this. And again, the main import of, of this episode is not so that your, your head can be into debates between scholars, you know, because that, that's what scholars do. You know, they, they go back and forth with each other, you know, arguing this or that point. That's just part of the enterprise, you know. And, and, and all the people that I've mentioned here are, are, are good people. You know, there, there's nobody in the bunch here that is just, you know, grinding an ax against, you know, the Christian faith or something like that. They're, they're, you know, there, there's nobody like that in, in, in this list. Again, the, the people that I've mentioned, it's just that there's honest disagreement, you know, among scholars, but I wanted to have a place where at least, you know, why, uh, again, this is one evangelical who is not afraid of this material. I love it. Again, this, this is, this is where, where I spent my time in my dissertation. And again, to my advisor's credit, um, uh, he, he rolled with it. He, he allowed me to do it. He allowed me to challenge uh, the consensus view. And I, I think he would, he would admit that, you know, hey, you know, it, it probably needs this, probably needs some challenge. You know, I don't know if I won him over, um, probably not. Again, he's, he's going to be part of the mainstream, but to his credit, you know, he, he let me do this. So, Peer-reviewed scholarship, you know, this this sort of thing in at the dissertation level, at the publication level, yeah, they, you know, there's no monolithic belief system that everybody has to conform to. That's not what scholars do. And so this, you know, it, it's a good exchange. It's a friendly exchange. I like everybody in the mix here, you know, that, I, that I've met. So let's be clear on that. I, I'm not going to be, you know, you're not going to be able to caricature me as being, you know, like antagonistic toward anybody. I like them all. They, I enjoy them everybody that I've, that I've included in the discussion here. But I wanted a place where I could at least talk a little bit about why I don't buy this stuff 
and also the value of, again, these ancient contexts for these two psalms, and of course, by extension, lots of other passages too. Yeah, Mike, one of your biggest uh, criticism probably from other people is that you're, they think that you're saying you need external resources to understand the Bible. And it's, it's ridiculous how they have this argument that um, without all this extra literature, you can't understand the Bible. And that's not really what you're saying. No, no. I mean, you, you can get the core ideas out of Scripture just reading an English Bible. Okay, you, you can't have a firm grasp of a lot of things without situating the Bible in its own context. So, you know, the Bible did not just drop from heaven, okay, as though it has no context at all, like it just materialized. Uh, God used people. He used people at a certain time, a certain place, a certain worldview, a certain culture. These are God's decisions. So if you don't like the external context being part of the interpretive process, go complain to God, okay, because these were his decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I I find it it enhances my faith. You know, all this extra oh, I, material, too. it enhances it. So it's funny when I get people uh, who've been in seminary, some of my friends, and they've asked me uh, since diving into this material stuff, what has it done to your faith, faith and stuff? Because we all heard the stories that students yeah. enter seminary and they kind of lose their faith or they get discouraged. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This has only enhanced it. So I question people's faith going into it, if they, if all of this extra material starts to break down their faith, I'm like, this yeah, the, adds to it. Yeah. The, the, the real, I think the real, the underlying problem to that is they go to seminary with certain views of certain things. Let's just say for, for the sake of the discussion, how we got the Bible, like how, how the, how the thing we call the Bible was produced. They have, they've been taught so minimally about that topic that when their professors start bringing in, you know, other data or asking, you know, important questions like, okay, like the superscriptions in the Psalms, the, the whole idea of editing, or maybe it doesn't mean to David or, or, or for, of David, maybe it means for, you know, all, that whole thing. They have never heard any of that before. And so they don't really know what to do with it. And some of that is going to feel so counter to the way they have been thinking about the topic to that point, that they're going to feel tension. And what you need, and, and unfortunately what's lacking in, in a number of instances, you need a professor sensitive to that who can, who can think through how this stuff makes sense and, and, and actually works with the theology that they already came with. In other words, just, 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 you have the same theology, but but let let's just change how that theology is talked about. Okay, how we how we talk about how we got the Bible and God's role and God's responsibility and stuff like this. I mean, this material should not squeeze God out of the equation. It should actually help us sort of think better about how God did things. But you know, you you need a professor who's capable of that. You need a professor who's willing to do that. Um, who who will who will take ten or fifteen minutes of a class to do that rather than making sure they cover you know pages three three through eight in their syllabus, you know it, there's a disconnect there that I think is really unfortunate, and and it, some students might end up in a hostile context where the professor loves to trouble his or her students. Again, that that happens. You know, I, I know people like that. All right, that that happens. So I understand students coming away with. Their, their faith is harmed, and it, there's a number of reasons why that might happen. But my point is that that is not a necessary result, or at least it shouldn't be. None of this stuff has made me like, oh boy, you know, is any of this, you know, to, to me, it just makes things a lot more exciting because <laughs> this is going to sound, I don't know how this is going to sound. One of the best tools for biblical scholars and, and theologians is to have a little bit of imagination. Okay, another what I mean by that is not so that you can add stuff to scripture, but so that you can you can take it apart and put it back together again. You can reimagine how God would have done this, how how in God's re interaction with human beings, how he could have used them to make this thing come to pass. But some people just can't do it. They they their faith is a series of propositions, a series of sentences. A, a very strict, this is the way we talk about this topic. 
And when they are unable to talk about the topic that same way again, they have nothing to substitute for it. And it, it creates tension and, and distrust and all these other things, which is really unfortunate. It just doesn't have to be that way. Well, hopefully they listen to the Naked Bible podcast to help. <laughs> yeah. Some... I mean, if, if really, if they did, they would get some of that. And I, yeah. I think it would help. All right, Mike, another good uh, episode. Uh, again, listeners, uh, be on the, uh, the lookout for updates for this week in Denver, if we will or if not have that live Q&A Friday. Again, Mike, uh, your family's in our prayers for your dad. And uh, I want to thank everybody else for listening to the Naked Bible podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.